So here we have a contrast color image um, where the airway has been colored different colors according to which bronchopulmonary segment we are looking at. So it's a good opener. This is actually gross anatomy, not histology, but you get the idea. So you'll have a greater appreciation for this once we look at the histology of the lung. But let's say that you end up being an oncologist and your patient has lung cancer and you can see on the scan, you're like, oh, awesome. The lung cancer is only like right there. It's not appearing to be in masses anywhere else in the lung tissue. So if I just cut off this piece, we should be able to contain the tumor. What you cannot do is just hack off a bit of the lung willy nilly. The reason is if you do that, your scalpel will pass through many other air passages, leaving them open to the thoracic cavity and that we cannot have. So if your lung needs to be resected for some reason, what you have to do as a surgeon is use imaging to isolate which bronchopulmonary segment or segments of the lung are affected by the tumors and then ligate the tube, so tie it off and then cut off only what's below it, which is tricky business. So lung surgery is no joke, it's very complex and you're getting a good look at why in this picture. Okay, so defining respiration. It has a lot of different definitions depending on how far zoomed in or out you are. So at the sort of whole organ system level, respiration is ventilation of the lungs. So you change the pressure in your thorax due to Boyle's law, air goes in, and you exchange gases with the air that you're putting in your chest. There's also respiration, which we sometimes call external respiration because you're exchanging gas molecules with the outside. Um, so it, it seems internal because it's happening in your lungs, but it's called external because you're exchanging useful molecules with what is outside of you. So this is the exchange of gases between the air and the blood. And then the internal respiration is between the blood and the tissue fluid. So after the aorta, you're in the systemic arteries, you're at the capillary level. This exchange is internal respiration. And then finally, you guys have all been through the cellular respiration gamut by now, some of you many times. So this is kind of the underpinning reason that we breathe because and I've said this before, but I'll say it again, our cells do not store ATP. ATP is synthesized about as fast as it's used up and exchanged for other molecules. And so what that means is the reason an interruption in oxygen supply is extra bad is because it puts our ATP production at a grinding halt. And then cells can't do the work that they need to do to stay alive and they end up dying. So everything from breathing in and out all the way down to using oxygen as a final electron acceptor, all of these things fall under the term respiration. Okay, so that pretty accurately describes the function of the respiratory system, but there are others as well. So in the last PowerPoint, I was talking about bicarbonate and where it comes from. It comes from the CO2 that your cells give off when they are uh, active and metabolically busy. You also can force air through your oral cavity at a particular speed and make mouth shapes. And that's what speech is, which is neat because then I can tell you science words and facts without having to do an interpretive dance or make funny faces at you. So it provides uh, communication at a distance, which is helpful. It also provides your sense of smell, affects the pH of body fluids. We talked about that. Um, angiotensin converting enzyme, it, which is a critical component of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, 
that actually is in the lungs. So if you look at the renin angiotensin aldosterone system sort of feedback loops, you'll find that the conversion step from angiotensin two to angiotensin one occurs in the lungs. So this is the component that the ACE inhibitors act on. Breathing, so lowering and then raising pressure in your thorax, actually pumps lymph and blood up your trunk, just like, it's, it's basically the same principle as when you use a straw to drink. So if you lower the pressure uh, above fluid in a tube, the fluid climbs the tube. That's how straws work. That's also how your inferior vena cava works, interestingly enough. Oh, we have a question in the chat and I want to acknowledge it because it's a really good one. And it is the following. If you hold your breath, will your pH increase or be and become more acidic or does it not happen that fast? Um, quick adjustment, um, it's uh, opposite. I know it's counterintuitive. Uh, low pH is more acidic, but yes, what you're saying is essentially correct. So if I decide to <gasps> stop breathing, if I were to, for example, sample my blood after I had held my breath immediately after, I would find that my blood had become a little bit more acidic. Yes. So it does actually happen that fast. Absolutely. Um, and I'll show you a cool diagram of why that matters later, because it seems like, you know, that would be bad, but there's a careful balance of pH and respiration that is upheld. And it's also a flexible balance, which allows you to adapt to different metabolic uh, sort of conditions. So that's a nifty feature as well. Thank you for the question. Great question. Additionally, and since we spent a lot of time talking about poop last time, um, breath holding and bearing down increases abdominal pressure. We call this the Valsalva maneuver. And this is the main way that we expel things and stuff from our bodies. So this includes urination, defecation, and also if you are carrying a fetus, expelling the fetus so that it can become a neonate. All right, so conducting division of the respiratory system. Um, quick note about conducting versus respiratory division. If you go to the short videos A and P topic by topic playlist on my YouTube channel, which is not officially part of this course, but there's useful resources on there, um, I actually give a a uh, drawn out breakdown of the difference and how they vary histologically and what all that means. So if you need after this, an additional sort of review sesh about how to understand the difference between conducting and respiratory, that's there for you already. So the conducting division is not that hard to understand. It's basically all the parts of your respiratory system that move air so we have bulk flow of air, internal wind, but no gas exchange. So it's important to be able to understand the difference between bulk flow of a fluid like a gas and gas exchange. Gas exchange is diffusion of gas molecules across a membrane. Bulk air movement is just boluses of air moving into and out. So conducting division is for physically moving masses of air. That's what it means. So this includes the nose and nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx. So the pharynx is from here down to about here. And then the larynx is your voice box. And then we've got your trachea, bronchi, and some of the bronchioles. So these are passages that are gonna serve only for airflow, no gas exchange. And we're actually, I'm using the term designs loosely. I don't believe in intelligent design, but uh, we've evolved and it's a nice design. Uh, you're, you're supposed to breathe through your nose. So your face is designed that way for a reason. You've got nasal turbinate bones covered in wet tissue. And I know that grosses some people out, but here's the deal. If you put 
structures in the way of air, it will swirl around in your nasal cavity in a turbulent fashion. And as it does that, it comes into contact with the walls of your nasal cavity and becomes moist. And that's because the interior surface of your lung is moist. So you need to moisten the air as it moves down into the lung um, because that's how gas exchange gets done. It has to be across a wet membrane. So I know that's icky, but it's true. This is also why if you've, speaking of having allergies, you know when you're trying to go to sleep and you can't breathe through your nose, so you just breathe through your mouth and then you wake up with a sore throat, you're not supposed to be breathe through your mouth for that long. That's why you wake up in pain if you sleep with your mouth open. Yeah, I agree. It is the worst. It really sucks. Um, so you're supposed to breathe through your nose. So the upper respiratory tract, and this is clinically relevant as well because this is the way that these are often medically described. So the upper respiratory tract is your nose through your larynx. So spaces where air is moving through before the trachea, essentially. Oops. Yeah, or if you if you have like some kind of a, a nasal blockage, which some people have, like if you have a deviated septum, for example, uh, I'm gonna echo the person that said air filters and puri purifiers, but also um, if you're really sick and you can't, you don't have a choice, uh, humidifier can save you a lot of pain in the morning. If you just turn it on, you're like, well, I have to breathe through my mouth, so I guess we're gonna do this. It really helps. Um, so yeah, upper respiratory tract is nose through larynx, and then lower respiratory tract is trachea through lungs. So you're probably already kind of familiar with these two terms because we talk about these when we talk about what kind of respiratory infection someone is experiencing. So do you have a cold, a rhinovirus? You have an upper respiratory tract infection. You're probably producing a lot of mucus. You're probably swollen and uncomfortable. You maybe have a weird sounding voice because your nasal cavity is all gummed up. That's an upper respiratory tract infection. If you have a wet cough ugh, um, and shortness of breath, wheezing, difficulty breathing, that's usually a lower respiratory tract infection. And those tend to be more uh, serious because they're closer to where you exchange gas with the world. So it's important to know the difference. And also if you're a parent to be able to recognize the difference in your children before things get bad. So where does the air go? Well, it doesn't go straight through to your blood. There is no direct contact between your blood and the air. That would be bad. There's all kinds of pathogens in the air. You don't want that. Instead, you have this cool adaptation where you take, frankly, a crap load of surface area and you cram it into the relatively small space of your thorax by having this complex tissue that is comprised of millions upon millions of tiny little simple squamous epithelium balls called alveoli. Uh, singular is alveolus. So this is an alveolus, this is an alveolus, uh, plural there alveoli, and then each one of these sort of globby cul-de-sacs of alveoli is the alveolar sac. So they're very, very thin walled. Again, the thick diffusion equation places diffusion distance as the denominator. So the smaller diffusion distance is, the faster diffusion will occur. And that's what we want here. And so each of these, not pictured here, by the way, but you can imagine it, um, around each of these little alveoli is wrapped a capillary bed. 